afternoon, 12.30 service. How are you? Woo! All right, in a moment, we're going to sing a song that I'm sure we all grew up singing, especially if you grew up here in the States. Um, this song is really special, and I, I hope we can dive into it and really be in the moment and realize that, to me, I think this was possibly the first Christmas song. So I hope that we can show our Lord today our excitement, the joy, and just the appreciation for the night that our Savior was born. Amen? So let's clap it up. center of our lives provides purpose, purpose in our pain, even when we can't see the next steps. So as we sing this, declare that He will be at the center. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Sing this out, come on. Worthy of all the praise we could ever Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus. 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Come on. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever
Wow, what an amazing time of worship. We can feel the Holy Spirit in this place and with the same feeling. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and feel Him. Because He is right now, right here, where you need Him. And this is the time that we need to take to just fill ourselves with His presence. Church, I don't know what anybody is going through right now. Some of us are in a very dark place. Some of us have, have lost loved ones this year. Some of us have family members that might be sick in the hospital. But the Lord knows. So right now as I pray, I want you to bring that to the altar. Because we can Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for this amazing time, Lord. Because we feel you moving right now in this place, Lord, in our lives, in the deepest part of our souls. Thank you, Father, because you are our firm foundation. And no matter what we're going through right now, Lord, we will not be shaken. Nothing will ever separate us from you, Lord. Help us, Father, to hold on to you. Help us, Father, to, to see you. Open up our eyes, Lord, in wonder of who you are, Lord. Where we need to drop to our knees, Lord, and really intake, Lord, who you are. Because that's the only time that we'll be able, Lord, to feel that strength that we need sometimes. But also, thank you because we can come with joy and gratitude because you've been good to us. And help us to see that too, Lord. Because no matter what happens tomorrow, Father, you're going to be good to us. And help us to see that and remember that, Lord. Because you're present in everything that we do, that we say, everything that's in front of us, Lord. So we praise you, we thank you, Lord, for just being who you are, Lord. We glorify your name this morning and we, we just sing praises to you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Amen, church. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Um, what an amazing, right time of worship filled with joy. So with that same joy, wave hello, blow a kiss, say hello to one another and prepare your hearts for the Word of God. Good afternoon, Elevate Church. Welcome back home, everyone. Great to see all of you guys so much here at Elevate Church, man. So happy to see you guys. Man, what a great video, right? What a great video. Listen, I, I wasn't thinking about doing this, but man, let's give it up for Adrian and Sabina, a power couple that have been working on our videos throughout the quarantine and time. Thank you, guys. Came from the heart. Man, that's amazing, the work that you guys are doing for our Lord. Thank you, guys, for this power couple that God has blessed us with. Welcome everyone to Elevate Church. Listen, happy six year anniversary today. Make six years that we changed our name to Elevate Church because God had done so many things, man. Six years ago, 
to the day uh, we decided to change our name and we announced it to the church. Uh, we transitioned from Miami Lakes Baptist Church to Elevate Church. We're continuing to be in a Baptist church, but we changed our name because we wanted a name that will bring focus to Christ and Christ alone. And our name is Elevate Church because our heart is to see Christ and Christ alone elevated in this place, in our hearts and our lives. We want Christ to be seated at the throne of our church. Man, if that's your heart as well, make some noise celebrating our God that we are here to elevate the name of Jesus Christ alone. Amen, church. Listen, it's also six years to the day where we announced the name of the change uh, of the uh, uh, the change of the name of our church but we also announced six years ago exactly to the day that uh, our vision to build the new building uh that we're wrapping up today right we announced that we're going to be expanding building a new building it's been six years man how crazy time has passed that we have been going through this process and how lengthy it is to do accomplish a task and a feat like that but man, we praise God because God delivers on his promises. What he put in our hearts, he has now produced before us. So let's praise our God also for that. And I want to remind everyone, um, at the end of the service, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a collection, a love offering. Remember, we're doing 12 days of giving and praying for this project. As we're getting to the end of the building facet, um, or, or the building phase of our construction, uh, now becomes the, the beginning of our financial responsibility. We are taking out a 30-year mortgage, and uh, there's a, a, a price that we have to pay monthly. And as we're finalizing those details, we're praying for God to provide. And I want to thank everyone that has been giving throughout these 12 days. Today, we're going to take a special love offering uh, for our Lord, for the building. I just can't finish giving my offering with my family, my kids. We prayed, uh, you know, and we gave to the Lord, and we're asking everyone just to do the same. And listen, if it's been a hard year and you don't have this year, and, and listen, you're going through a tough time, it's okay. We can pray and ask for the great provider to provide. That's all we're asking. Pray and to participate in any way, shape, or form that you can. And as you can see in this building, we're actually refacing this building as well. Uh, we're, in the future, we're going to be changing the windows. We've actually brought down all the stones, the coral face of this sanctuary. Uh, that's original. I haven't said this in any other service. So uh, um, I'll share it with you guys. Uh, that was real coral. That was live coral many years ago in the 60s. It was brought from Key West and put on our walls, uh, right? So if you would like a piece, that's up to you. Some people don't want to take a rock home. Some of you want to take a piece of coral and a piece of history of our church. Grab some because tomorrow they'll be gone, right? I have one for my, I'm silly like that. I have one in my office. And if you want one, just grab one on the way out. Uh, if you have a fish tank, you want a nice piece of coral, there you go. You want to take some, set it on eBay, give the proceeds to the building, go ahead, right? Whatever it is uh, that the Lord uh, uh, has for you guys, man. Uh, listen, I want to welcome all of our first time guests. If you're visiting us for the very first time, whether here live or online, or in the overflow, we want to welcome you in a very special way. So Elevate Church, on the count of three, let's welcome all our guests. One, two, three, come on. Welcome. Welcome. Great to see you guys. Great to see you guys. If you are our guest, we would love to know who you are. One way you can communicate to us, whether online or here physical, is go ahead and send a text message to the number 94,000. It's on the screens. Send a text message to the number 94,000 and text the word go elevate as one word it's going to send you a reply with a link click on the link fill it out and that's going to notify us of you being here for the very first time all right and if, if there's any next steps you would like to take like baptism next week we have a baptism uh, you can sign up by texting there in the bottom you can click uh, be baptized next week we have a special christmas baptism coming up so that's good stuff. With all that being said, let's look to God in prayer and let's ask God to speak to us now as we open up the word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, God, so much for this time. God, we have, ca we have gathered here for you, Lord, uh, to, to praise your name and to hear from you, God. So, Father, open up our hearts and our minds. Fill our hearts with wonder of who you are and what you've done, God. Speak loud and clear to us, God. God, if there's anyone who is distant from you, if there's anyone, Father, who doesn't know you, God, God, I pray that today will be the day that they will trust you as their Savior, God, that they will know that you created them and you have a purpose for their lives, God. Father, have your way, God. Let it be your words that are spoken here. And Father, I pray that we will respond to your holy living word. We love you, God. 
It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, church. Put our hands together for our God. Today we're going to continue on with our series. This, this year for Christmas we're doing a series titled An Awkward Christmas. And let me tell you, it's been an awkward Christmas so far. Anybody having an awkward Christmas so far? You go to the stores, it's not as packed. There, I feel like there's less merchandise, right? There's less toys. I guess people are buying more online, so stores didn't stock too much inventory. Man, people are, you know, it's, it's just different. Wearing masks. And we're going to have, you know, a Zoom Noche Buenas. Yesterday I had a Zoom wedding. That was kind of, you know, Know, nice and awkward at the same time, right? Uh, but man, what a crazy year we're living in. Uh, this year, we're, we're, we're looking and focusing in on the fact that the very first Christmas was an awkward Christmas. That's what we're learning, that I think it's more awkward than this year. The very first Christmas started off, and we talked about it three weeks ago, we, it starts off with an awkward invitation. Angels come to this teenage young girl named Mary, says, get with a message from God that God has chosen you to be the mother of Jesus, the son of God, a virgin girl who had never uh, you know, been married, and, and she's you know, a teenage young girl. That's awkward for Joseph, who was engaged to be married. That was awkward for him. Last week, we talked about Magi giving some awkward gifts uh, to uh, baby Jesus coming from afar. Today, we're going to look at having awkward guests. Awkward guests. Anybody ever have awkward guests to a party or a party crashers sh showing up? Anybody here? Raise up your hand if you've ever had party crashers. You did not invite them. You're like, who is that, right? Some of you, right? How many of you, let's, let's take it a step. How many of you have ever crashed a party? Be real. God is watching. Man, this is more than that service, right? Man, you guys are the real deal. You guys have, you've heard of like a wedding crashers and all this. Listen, I have, how about baby delivery room crashers? That's, that, that's what, and some of your moms can relate, right? You know, you just gave birth, you're tired, and, and this on of that you've never met. Hey, I'm here. How, where's the baby? Let me carry it. The baby's head is bobbing all over the place, you know? And uh, that's what happened to Joseph and Mary. They had awkward guests show up in the delivery room, people they never seen in their life. They're there. Mary must be exhausted. Joseph is tired and stressed because, you know, and I know how it is. They, you know, you know the moms, they'll grab onto their husband's arms like, oh, it's your fault. Oh, your hand's like, oh, you know. And, well, in the middle of that chaotic night for them, in walk these guys that are shepherds. And they didn't come along. These shepherds are coming from the field. They, they're dirty. They're messy. They're stank. They smell like Doritos, you know, and coming in from, from afar. And, and they're there. And, and they, they didn't come alone. They came with their sheep. Their sheep. We got a couple friends coming in here. They were, like, oh, you know, all around. And, you know, how awkward this must have been for Mary and Joseph. Let's read about um, this story on how they had awkward guests uh, the day that Jesus was born. Luke chapter 8, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20. And we're going to look at this awkward, uh, you know, these awkward guests that arrive in, 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 a, in a not so, you know, in a moment that was kind of awkward for them as well. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And it said, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field. They were keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them in the middle of the night. And the Lord, the glory of the Lord shone around them. That's kind of awkward as well. You imagine being in a dark, empty field, a couple of, uh, you know, sheep and shepherds, and all of a sudden an angel shows up, all this light, you know, it makes me think of those movies back in the day, Signs, and all, where all these aliens show up, and E.T. phone home. You know, how awkward was that in the middle of the night to see that spectacle? I would have freaked out, right? It said the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I don't blame them. They were scared out of their lives, right? And then, and then the angel said to them, chill out, bro. He goes, fear not, for behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And then here's the good news they bring. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What great news that a child has been born who would be the Savior of the world. And then he says, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths 
and lying in a manger. That's awkward, a baby lying in a manger. That's not where babies are typically born, right? And suddenly in that announcement, there, were, there was with the, the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. All these other angels filled the sky, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace amongst those whom he is pleased. That's what the message of, of Christmas is all about. It is of peace. And as Dora was saying earlier, some of us might be treading through some difficult times right now. Your season might be a little darkened, but remember that Christmas is about the Prince of Peace who has come to bring peace in our chaos, to bring light in our darkness. And the Lord is with you and he can give us peace. It says, and on earth, peace. And then it says in verse 15, when the angels went away from, from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Pretty much they got together and they're like, let's be chimosos and let's crash this baby delivery room and let's just show up this amazing thing that's happening. So it says, and they went with haste. They were in a hurry and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, right? Uh, they showed up and they're like, bro, man, bro, man, what you doing here, you know? <laughs> and then going on, it says, and when they saw it, when they saw the child, they made known. Everybody say made known. They told everybody that they knew. They ran and they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And look at the result, verse 18. And all who heard wondered, right? We just sang, God, open our, our hearts up to wonder. They, were, they wondered. People were wondering what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things in verse 19, pondering in her heart, uh, them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen at is, as it had been told to them. Man, I believe that the story of these shepherds crashing the delivery room and showing up unannounced, right? I believe that God really is, is showing, putting on display. He's describing a little bit of who Christ is for us, who he came to be and what he came for. So point number one, the story of the shepherds teach us, point number one, that Jesus came to save the poor, outcasts, and the humble. Jesus came to save the poor, the outcasts, and the humble. Man, and, and when I mention these things, I'm talking in spiritual terms. Jesus came to, to save the spiritually poor, the spiritually outcasted, and the spiritually humble of heart people. That is who Jesus <clears throat> came to save. Now, let me ask you a quick question, man. If you had good news to share who would you share it with? Like, let's say you hit the lotto, right? Who would be the first person or first people you would, uh, you know, that would change 2020. <laughs> it went from the worst year to the best year, right? But I'm sure you hit the lotto, <clears throat> you're not going to tell many people, right? You'll probably be like, oh, let me be careful who I tell, right? You never know. that All of a sudden, you have all these new friends, right? <clears throat> <laughs> My homeboy, you hit the lotto. I don't even know you. Bro, man, who are you, right? <laughs> and, and so then, and man, how about like when, you know, your, your, your spouse is pregnant or you became engaged. Who are the very first people that you tell when you found out your spouse was pregnant or that you, you know, you hit the honor roll if you're a young person or if you're, you're getting married or who are the first people that you tell good news to? Man, this makes me think of my engagement. Yesterday, my wife and I made 22 years of our dating, you know, our dating relationship. You know, I, uh, 22 years ago yesterday at a church, I asked my girlfriend out, Betsy, to be my girlfriend, right? And of course, she said yes. She was like, of course, yes, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Just kidding. It didn't go down that way. She was like, oh, of course. <laughs> Who would want? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> And she said yes, and, you know, and that was 22 years ago. And actually, um, you know, I actually proposed to her uh, years later, uh, December 12th. Uh, and and it, was, it was about, let me see, I don't want to get this wrong. And Betsy, I know you're hearing. I, I didn't forget, I promise. Uh, anyways, it, it was, I think it was 19, uh, no, 2001. I think it was 2001 where I proposed, right? Or 2002. It's been years. It's been years. So it makes 20 years yesterday, I hope I'm right, 
give or take, <laughs> that I proposed to my wife, Betsy. And I remember that day. It was awesome, right? I, I went ahead and, and, um, and, and, and I proposed to her. And I got all romantic. I took her. You know, we're going to celebrate our anniversary, right? It was an upgrade because the first year, I happened to be by there where, uh, yesterday uh, where we celebrated our first year anniversary of dating. And, and I was with Louis. I was like, look, that's the restaurant that I took mom the first year that we made, you know, an anniversary of dating. And she was like, and, my, and, and Louis was like, really? You took mom to McDonald's? And that's exactly where I took her for our first year because we were in a hurry because we had a curfew. She was young. We had to get home, drive through, and that's it, right? Anyway, so, so that year when I proposed to her, I got all romantic, and I was like, man, I got to raise up the bar from the Golden Arches. So I took her to Vizcaya, right? I took her to Vizcaya. I took her to the little tea house in the corner, you know, and, and right by the bay, best fishing spot ever. And, 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 you know, just there, and I got on her knee, and I asked her to marry me, and she was like, of course I'll marry you, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Just kidding. All right, didn't go down that way, but yes, she said yes. And, um, and, and, and then we were so excited. You know, we had paid for this uh, restaurant, and that was super expensive, way too much money. But we ate in a hurry because we couldn't wait. Like the shepherds, they went in haste. We ate in a hurry because we couldn't wait to tell our family members the good news. Now, this is how I did it. I was very private. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my brothers. I didn't tell anybody in this world. The only one that knew was one friend and then my wife at that moment. So it was a surprise for everybody that we had gotten engaged. So after we ate our, swallowed our too expensive meal, we ran, and the first stop we went to was to my grandparents. I'll never forget. I went to Mima and People's house, right? Every Hispanic family has a Mima and People, right? Anybody here have a Mima and People in your family? Raise up your hand, right? You have a Mima. How many of you are Mimas and Peoples? Any Mimas and Peoples in the house? Yes. We have two. Last service, we were like, no, no, no. Yeah. So we have two here, right? So I went to Mima and People's house, and I told them, hey, you know, we got engaged, and Mima almost had a heart attack, and people, you know, they were like, oh. You know, and, and then you know, we were so excited. Then from there, we were like, all right, do, do we go to my parents' house or Betsy's mom's house? And we're like, Betsy's mom, she's going to have a real heart attack. So you know what? We went to my parents' house to get some support. We told my parents. They were so excited about it. And they knew we were going to continue on. So we'll jump in the car with you. So they jumped in our car. And we did this celebratory caravan. We went from this house, picked up my parents, and went to my mother-in-law's house. We told her she did pass out. But after five minutes, she was excited. She got in our car. Then we started going to, like, family's house, brother's house, cousin's house. And every house we went to, they jumped in our car or jumped in there car and we just started going to everybody it was it was a so much excitement and we had this great news and the very first people we wanted to tell were the people who were closest to us and we wanted to tell them first in this first christmas god had the greatest news to tell the world and he told the people who were closest to the heart first and the people who are closest to god's heart are the spiritually hum uh, humble, the spiritually poor, and the spiritually outcasted. To shepherds, he went to shepherds, those who were humble, people who are far from God, who, people who, who are humble. Those are the people who are dearest to God's heart. You see, because shepherds, they were poor. They were outcasted. They were kind of low on the social level. If you think of shepherds historically in the Bible, a prime example of shepherds being outcasted was David. You think of King David of Israel back in the day. Before he was the king, he had a little uh, part-time, right? He was a shepherd. And as a shepherd, you know, he was outcasted and overlooked even by his own family. Because God had told the prophet Samuel that he was going to choose um, a new king from it, for Israel from the family of Jesse, which was da David's father. One of Jesse's sons was going to be the new king. So when Samuel went to, to, to Jesse, hey, God is going to choose one of your sons to be king, and I need you to present him. Jesse call, uh, called all his sons and showed up and he paraded them. Oh, this one's muscular, but not him. Oh, this one's tall and good looking, not him, right? This one looks like he's brilliant, right? He's, not him. And he paraded all of his sons. And at the end, it was none of them. And Samuel's like, what's going on here? He's like, man, are all of your sons here, Jesse? And let's, let's look at what God said. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10, it said, in the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. 
But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all of, your, all of the sons that you have? And Jesse was like, oh, about that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, there's still another one. I have an, another son. Uh, he's the youngest um, yeah, and Jesse replied, but, but he's out there in the fields and he's watching the sheep and goats. He's a shepherd. Nobody's going to choose a humble shepherd to be the king of, of, of Jerusalem. Like God is not going to use him. He's just a, she, a, a shepherd out there, you know, smelling like Doritos. You don't want nothing to do with him. And Samuel's like, wait a minute. He's like, he said, send for him at once. Go get that other son. I asked you to bring all your sons. His father outcasted his own son because he was a shepherd. So he goes ahead and he says, send for him at once, Samuel said. And he says, and you better hurry. And he says, and we will not sit down to eat until he arrives. And it reminds me of my parents when I was a kid. You're going to go out. You, out. you better go and fix what you did. And I'm going to stay standing here until you come back. Samuel's like, I'm going to wait right here until you bring your son. And at the end, he brings Smelly, dirty old David, this young boy, to come in, the outcast of the family, the shepherd. And indeed, that is the humble man that God chose to be the next king of Israel. Man, people who are humble, people who are, 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 are distant from God, people who are humble, who are poor, who are outcasted, who are forgotten, who are lonely, those are the people that are dearest to God's heart. And when he had this incredible news, he wanted to tell you know, these shepherds, shepherds back then, they weren't even trusted. They were not allowed to testify in any court of law on earth in that time. Their word was not trusted trustworthy so they weren't allowed to testify so if you get in a car accident with one of them listen you go you take them to court they can't speak you're going to win the ticket every time right they're going to they're going to get the ticket it's going to be their fault because they were not even trusted to testify in court so i find it incredibly awkward that god would choose to announce the greatest news of all time to the least of society man you would have thought if god is going to call if God is going to make this announcement, the creator of the heavens and the earth is going to send his son to this earth, you would think, man, why, why did he announce it in Rome, right? The political headquarters of the time to Caesar Augustus, right? The emperor of Rome, the, the, the headquarters of the political you know, society at that time. All of the different embassies were there, all these political figures. Why did he go to Rome? Why did he go to Athens, Greece? Athens, Greece was the, the, where the great philosophers were, where they shared the thinking of that time or why didn't he go and announce it in Jerusalem which is the religious headquarters of the world where his own temple was was built and where all of these religious people were there serving him supposedly and he, why did he go to Jerusalem he didn't go to Jerusalem he didn't go to Rome he didn't go to Greece he didn't go to New York he didn't go to LA he didn't go to Hollywood he didn't go to Miami he didn't go he chose Bethlehem he didn't choose political figures and the wealthy and the upper classes he chose shepherds why because people who are humble of heart are dear to the Lord and those whom he chose to be the first ones to hear the greatest news and it tells us this it reveals to us that this is why Christ came to save those who are humble of heart Luke chapter 4 verse 18 just two chapters later it tells us the purpose of Jesus coming Luke 4 18 it says the spirit of the Lord is upon me this is Jesus speaking entering into Jerusalem as an adult starting his ministry he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me for what to bring good news to whom the poor, the poor in spirit. Remember the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? It says, he has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see and that the what? The oppressed will be set free. This is why Christ came. These are the people who are closest to God's heart. Spiritually humble, spiritually poor, spiritually outcasted, the ones that are hurting, those who are broken, those who are forgotten the ones that know that they need a savior that is the heart there is no heart more filled with wonder and awe than a humble heart someone knows that they're a sinner and far from God 
If God would have gone to Caesar Augustus, hey, um, my son's going to be born. Caesar Augustus would have said, I'm a god. They thought they were gods. I'm like, I'm not impressed. If he would have gone to the philosophers and were like, hey, listen, which god? Zeus or, you know, and you think of, you know, Greek mythology and all the other deities that they believed in. They would have gone to, to Jerusalem. Those religious elite wouldn't have believed. They actually never received Jesus as the Messiah. It's those who are humble of heart that are most filled with awe of who God is. And those shepherds were the ones who when they saw and they heard them being humble of heart and they saw this, they were thrilled. They were filled with wonder and awe and so thrilled that they could not contain themselves. And they would run and see the child. And when they saw the child, they were blown away at what they had seen so that they ran into the town and were the very first evangelists. They told everyone what they had seen. I imagine them running with excitement saying, guys, he's back. The God of the Bible is back. The one that we heard about in the Old Testament. The God of Abraham and Isaac. He has sent his Messiah. His glory shown again. He's back. It's true. The word is true. And that changes everything. Hope is restored. There's peace on earth. The Messiah is here, guys. He is back. They went running to tell as many people as possible. Luke chapter 2, 17, it says, And when they saw it, they made known that saying it had been told concerning the child, and all who heard it wondered. These shepherds ended up being the very first evangelists that when telling others about the gospel of Jesus Christ, they weren't trusted to be witnesses in any court of law on earth. So God chose them to be witnesses on behalf of heaven on earth of the greatest occurrence in the history of the world. This is what, happen, what happens when the lowest of society receive the greatest news of highest importance. They were so thrilled that they ran telling as many people as possible. Church, never allow the magic of the season of Christmas and, and the Christmas trees and the lights and Santa and the elves in the shelves, which I don't get still. You know, <laughs> um, I don't understand that. And you know, never allow the business of Christmas to rob you of the wonder and the awe of the child that was born in Bethlehem. Don't let it happen, church. Worship God. Let there be joy because it is true. He came back for us and he came to save us. So why shepherds? Because I believe God wanted to tell the world that Jesus came to save the spiritually poor, spiritually outcasted, and the spiritually humble. Point number two, reason why I believe he chose shepherds is because I believe that Jesus wanted to reveal to the world that Jesus came to be a shepherd for his people. I believe that this is what he's trying to do. Like, think about this. What's up with all these shepherds in the Bible? Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. And now, how about sheep? Sheep in the Bible are the most mentioned animals in the whole Bible. Man, what's up with all this? You know, there's a theological term, anthropomorphism. And it is, it is displaying and, 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 and characterizing God in human form, it is try, it's using like an analogy, something from this earth to try to describe God. And one of the anthropomorphisms that we see in the Bible where God uses human terms to describe himself is a shepherd. We know that he's not a shepherd, he's God, but he's like a shepherd. 
And I believe that all those times that God chose to use shepherds like David and Moses and Abraham, and then all of the parables that were taught by Jesus about shepherding and sheep and all of the prophets who use those terms of shepherding and sheep and Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd and all of these, you know, feed my sheep, all of these pictures, I believe, and, and him choosing shepherds to announce this great truth. I believe that all through scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God is painting this picture. I want you to know how you can relate to me and how I can relate to you. I am the great shepherd, said Jesus. I am the good shepherd. And I came and and my sheep know my voice and I know them. Maybe God is telling us I came to be like a shepherd of your soul. And I desire for you to be the sheep of my pasture, the sheep of my flock. Christmas reveals this, the prophecies that were foretold in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the, the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be the ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old. This person is of ancient of days, right, from ancient of days. And it says, and he, in verse 4, it says, and he shall stand as what? He shall stand and what? And shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Hundreds of years before, the prophet Micah is saying there's going to be a Savior born in Bethlehem, and he is going to be like a shepherd over his flock. God is up to something when he uses sheep and shepherd countless times. He wants to be crystal clear and paint a beautiful picture of how he wants to be and how he wants to relate to you and you relate to them. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, right? In verse uh, John chapter 10, verse 14. So important. Man, if you think of the role of the shepherd, the role of the shepherd is vital to the sheep. The best way that I could describe as I thought about it this week, I had a couple of conversations that shaped my thinking for this. And I believe that God was preparing me for this. Man, the best way that I can describe the importance of the shepherd for the sheep, I believe it's like the importance that it is for there to be a dad for his children. A father in the home is so important. Man, a child needs his dad. A sheep you know, or, or, or a lamb, they need their shepherd to guide them. A child, children need their father to provide for them, to protect them, to guide them, to, to help them, to protect them, to be with them. The relationship of the shepherd and the sheep is a lifelong relationship. The shepherd of a father and his children is a lifelong relationship. Every single day guiding, every single day providing, walking with them. The shepherd guides the sheep from when they're lambs all the way to their grown-up sheep, even to their point of death. The whole life they are dependent on the sheep and on the shepherd. This week, I had a conversation with a good friend of mine that lost his father very young. He was very young when his father passed away. He was just a boy. And he, something he was telling me is like, man, it always bothered me when people will tell me, you know, I know what you're going through. And he was, he'll be like, you don't know. He was a young boy, so he would say it. He's like, you don't know what I'm going through. He even had sisters. He was telling me, man, I had sisters. And they will come to me. I mean, we're siblings. We lost the same father. They'll come to me. He's like, we know what you're going through. We lost dad too. And he'll turn around and says, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know. A boy needs his dad. And he was telling me, like, who's going to show me how to throw a football? Who's going to show me how to play catch? Who's going to walk with me? Who's going to take me fishing? A boy needs his dad every single day. A boy needs his dad. And the sheep need the shepherd to guide them every single day, to protect them, to provide for them. Listen, a sheep without a shepherd is lost. Man, a boy, children without their dad are hurting. And people without Jesus as their shepherd, shepherding their soul, are lost, are lonely, 
are far from God, and life is hard. Listen, your soul needs a shepherd, just like children need their parents, and just like sheep need their shepherd. You cannot do life alone. That's why it's so difficult to go through some hard times, and you feel like there's no hope. If you do not have Jesus as your good shepherd, you are walking through this life alone, but here I am to tell you it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way, and even if you lost your dad or, or, or mom very early on in your life. Listen, Jesus is like a father to us. He will be your shepherd. He'll step in that role and he'll walk with you every single day of your life. He'll guide you. He'll protect you and he'll provide you. The father of all fathers extends a hand in Christmas says, come to me. I will guide you. I will lead you. And the beautiful picture that we have of the shepherd is in Psalms 23. Anybody ever heard Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. David writes, look at how he paints this picture of the good shepherd. He is painting a picture of Jesus. He writes, the Lord is my shepherd and I have all that I need, right? Christ came to be our good shepherd and he provides for me, church. He provides for you. Let's say it together. Everybody repeat after me. He provides for me. Say it again. He provides for me. The Lord is your shepherd. He provides for us. It goes on in verse 2. It says that he lets me rest in green meadows and he leads me beside peaceful streams. Church, he came to be our shepherd to bring us peace. Repeat after me. He brings me peace. Say it again. He brings me peace. And let me tell you, some of you might be struggling. Some of you might be going through hard times. But the good shepherd came to bring you peace in the midst of the storms of life that you might be going. He is there with you every step of the way of your life to bring you peace continually. Verse 3, it says that he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Jesus came to bring strength to those who are in weakness. He gives us strength, just like a dad telling his boy, you can do it. I believe in you. Man, listen, he gives us strength. He renews our strength. Some of you are worn out by the trials of life, but the good shepherd renews our strength. He gives us wings like eagles. He allows us to run and not grow weary. He's there with you. He strengthens us. He gives us the strength that you need. And I know some of you are hurting. I prayed with some of you before service. He He gives you the strength that you need. Repeat after me. He gives me strength. Once again, he gives me strength. That is the good shepherd. And he goes on and says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the the valley that everyone wants to avoid, the shadow of death, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, death, I will not be afraid for you are what? Close beside me. You are close behind me. Listen, the Lord is with us. The shepherd, the good shepherd, he came to walk closely with us from here all the way to heaven. It is a lifelong relationship that we have with Christ. He came and every single second of every single minute of every single hour of your life, he walks with you. And even in those trying times and even at the end of your life, when you are facing death, when you are going through that dark valley of death, even then you will fear nothing because the good shepherd walks with his sheep every single day of their life, man. So listen, repeat after me. I am never alone. alone. Say it again. I am never alone. alone. Whoever has the good shepherd as a shepherd of their soul is never alone. And let me tell you, if Jesus is not your shepherd, listen, you're lost, man. You're far from God and you're hurting. And listen, life was not being meant for you to walk alone. Everybody needs someone to turn to, to draw strength from. That is the good shepherd. You'll never be alone. Nothing to be fearing. It goes on to say, your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. Man, God is there to comfort comfort us, to protect us. It doesn't matter whatever battles we face. It doesn't matter how much try, how many trying times we're facing. He protects us. Repeat after me. He protects us. Say it again. He protects us. 
That is what the good shepherd does for us. He goes on to say, verse 5, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows with blessings. The good shepherd fills our lives with blessings. He provides, he blesses us. And it, doesn't, it might not mean riches and all these things. We could have had a hard year, but as we are ending this year, we can look back and say, thank you, God, for your blessings blessings. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your health. I am here because of your strength and he has blessed us and he has brought us here. The shepherd came to bless us. Repeat after me. He blesses our life. Say it again. He blesses our life. And then he ends by verse 6, surely goodness and, and, and mercy and unfailing love will pursue me. Listen, will pursue his goodness and his mercy will pursue you. Doesn't matter how far you run from God, his mercy and his goodness will be following you all the days of his life. Like the good shepherd doesn't let that sheep go astray. Doesn't matter how hard the times are. He will follow you. His goodness and his mercy and his unfailing love will pursue you all the days of my life life every single day and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Church, all of these blessings and all of these privileges that we gain from the good shepherd are ours forever because he is ours forever, not just through this life, but through eternity as well. Church, repeat after me. He is ours forever. Say it again. He is ours forever. From here to heaven, every single day, every single minute, every single hour, every single season, he is our shepherd. That is why Jesus chose the shepherds, because he wants to paint a picture to you that he wants to be your shepherd. Don't miss it. Jesus came to be your shepherd great shepherd your great shepherd the psalm says the lord is my shepherd i love the personal focus here he is my shepherd repeat after me church the lord is my shepherd again say it again the lord is my shepherd now say like you mean it. he's mine right the lord is my shepherd Maybe some of you have never said this. You've never looked at Christ and the Lord and never have said in your life, Lord, you are my shepherd. I've never, maybe this is the first time. Say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. Mine. He is my shepherd. The only question that is left to ask is, are you his sheep? If you are not his sheep, look at everything we're missing out on. The shepherd of our soul. Are you his sheep? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. You know what's one way how we can know if you are his sheep? If you know the shepherd. How do you know if you know the shepherd? Let me illustrate it this way. There was once this professor who taught a class, and he was a great orator. He would recite poems, and, and one day he stood and he recited Psalm 23 very eloquently. I mean, this guy was a master orator. He went out there, and he stood up before his class, this professor, and he says, the Lord, probably in this Sean Connery voice, right? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He renews my soul. I don't know, but he guides me along the paths, bringing honor to his name, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Probably wrapped up in this great voice, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Great oratory said it flawlessly. And after this, great professor flawlessly presented Psalm 23. Then he calls out a student, singles out a student, says, now it's your turn. I want you to go ahead and recite Psalms 23. This student was very shy, very timid, and he was so nervous when he got called upon. And he came up 
nervously, right? And he never wanted to. He dreaded the day. He probably didn't like speaking in public. And he stood up in front of the class. And he started. And he came up and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I, I shall not want. And he began to tremble. Because he began to process what he's saying. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And he's thinking how, how good Jesus had been in his life. And had done for him. And he continues as he's emotional and shaking. And he continues. He, says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He renews my strength. And he guides me along the right paths. Bringing honor to his name. And thinking of all the good things that the good shepherd had done for him and who Jesus represented in his life, this student began to weep. And he began to cry. And he went on. And every, every line, every verse, he was even more impacted at what he was saying. And towards the end, he was just bawling. He was a mess. His voice would crack. He had a knot in his throat. He could barely speak. And he's saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. And he ended up in a mess. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When he finished, the whole class erupted in a standing ovation, clapping and saying, what an amazing presence. Everybody was blown away at how this student had recited Psalms 23. And the pro professor walks up and he says, listen, class. He goes, I know the psalm. But this student here, he knows the shepherd. Big difference between knowing the psalm and knowing the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Do you know the shepherd? Are you one of his sheep? Does this truth impact you? Or are you numb to the fact that Jesus loves you? Do you know the shepherd? Jesus says in verse 14 of chapter 10 of John. He says, I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And look at this last line of what separates Jesus from any other shepherd. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's a shepherd who is willing to die so that you could be part of his flock. Want to know how to be a shepherd? You want to know how to be a sheep in Christ's flock? Trust Jesus. For you to be a sheep in his flock, he died on a cross for you. Now you might be thinking, why? Why did he have to die? Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. That means we're all sinners. None of us are righteous in our own. None of us are good enough to get to heaven including myself. We're all sinners. The Bible says it. All of us like sheep, we have strayed away. It says we have left God's paths to follow our own. I'm guilty. We're all guilty of this. Yet, the Lord laid on him, on Jesus, the sins of us all. We are all sinners. All of us. We don't deserve to be part of his flock. The Bible says that there's a consequence for us being sinners. The Bible says that the consequence of sin is death. And death in the Bible is separation from God. And the only place separate from God in all of eternity is hell. That's what, that's what we deserve because of our sins. That's what I deserve because of my sin. All of us like sheep, we have gone astray. But the only way to pay for our sin is through a death. And God knew that it's either us dying for our sins and us being separated or him coming himself and laying down his life on a cross and dying for us. And that's exactly what the good shepherd did. When Jesus was on that cross, he absorbed all of the judgment, all of the consequences of your mistakes, of your sins, of my sins, of my mistakes, all of it. He took it all on the cross so that you can be forgiven 
be made part of his flock so that you could be a sheep in his holy flock and so that he can give you everlasting life. Listen, it doesn't matter the sins that you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter the places that you've been, the dark things that you've thought of and done. It doesn't matter how tarnished you are by the world that we live in and by the sin that we have practiced. God loves you. And he's the good shepherd. And he laid down his life for you and me. And the way that you could become his sheep is by believing that Christ took your pain and took your, your sins on the cross and be forgiven by him. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that whoever believes in him, whoever places their life and their soul in his hands says, God, for eternity and for heaven, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to trust me. I'm not going to trust that I go to church or my religion or my good works. Listen, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve heaven. My life is in your hands. I believe whoever believes in him will not perish but have ever lasting life. Today, I want to invite you, whoever's listening, right here, right now, you could be a sheep in God's holy flock. He will be your shepherd. Today, I invite you to trust Jesus as your Savior for the forgiveness of all your sins and for eternal life in heaven. And what I'm going to invite you to do right now is to pray with me this prayer, trusting Jesus as your Savior. Repeat after me if you would like to make this important decision today. If you're watching online, wherever you are, just pray this prayer and repeat after me. Here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I am a sinner and I don't deserve heaven. I now turn from my sins. I believe that Jesus lived and that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. And on the third day, I believe that Jesus resurrected, that he conquered my sin and he conquered my death. Save me, Jesus. I call upon your name. Give me everlasting life. Give me your Holy Spirit and help me to live a brand new life for your glory. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, church. Let's put our hands together for our God. Congratulations to all of you who made the best decision you could ever make. Man, if you made that decision online, we would love to know about it. Right now in the comment section, go ahead and write, I prayed that prayer. Anybody in here prayed that prayer for the first time? We just want to celebrate. We just want to clap for you. Anybody? Just raise up your hand real quick. Awesome. Listen, Dad's going to give you guys some more instructions about baptism and all these other things. But right now, I want to put your attention on the 12 days of giving. Today, you know, marks six years that we launched a vision for the new building. And I'm going to invite you guys to pray right now to prepare as we're going to prepare to take this special love offering. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart. And listen, if it's been a hard year, you can offer prayer in this moment and ask God to provide. Help us continue to impact Miami Lakes and to finish off this project. We love you guys. God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor Lou. Hey, by the way, I have a message from Betsy. Uh, she wants you to, uh, well, she'll talk to you about the house, something about not remember the anniversary date or something. She was watching, bro. She was watching and taking notes. So, uh, Merry Christmas, man. Elevate Church, happy birthday. Listen, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have, we're going to have the usher stand here. We're going to pray for this offering. And then after we pray, we're going to do the announcements. It's kind of a little bit backwards how we normally do it, but like Pastor Lewis said, today is such a special day. 12, 13, 20 does not fall. 12, 13 doesn't fall that many Sundays, so exactly six uh, years to the day. So let's pray. God, thank you, Lord, so much for who you are. You're so good. God, here we are six years later from the initial name change of our church and the, the vision cast of the new temple, the new building. Thank you, Father, because that is um, nothing more than a tool that you're building to further reach out your kingdom here on earth. And, and Lord, we are beyond grateful for what you've done. We are beyond grateful for what you're doing. And Lord, we are beyond grateful for what you will do. So Lord, um, please accept this offering that we are about to collect. And Lord, we ask that you would multiply it, that you would invest it, Lord, that it would continue to 
pay off the building and the, re and the remodel of this building, that Elevate Church in this corner would stand strong until the day that you return, Lord, and we would always proclaim the truth of Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Elevate Church, as our ushers pass out the collection uh, plates, I have a couple of quick announcements. Number one, welcome home. If you're watching online for the very first time or if you're sitting here or in Overflow for the very first time, welcome home. Welcome back. I've seen some, some familiar faces that are back for the first time in, in a couple of months, so welcome back. Listen, if you are here or online, do us the honor. Send us a text message. We want to connect with you, whether it's your first time or your 50th time. If you haven't sent the word, go Elevate to the number 94000, please do so. It is a, just a quick couple of seconds. What will happen is you are going to get a link back via text. Go ahead and follow that link and fill it out. It is our digital connect card. If it's your first time there, check that off. If you made that decision to follow Christ, check that off. If you want to be baptized, you can check it off there. Or simply, if you're just updating your information, you, there's an option for you too. And parents, super duper important. If you have kids within Elevate Kids and you have not done so, please do so and make sure to add your kids with their date of birth, all that, all for security reasons as we check your little ones in. Um, it'll be all nice and done and it's, it'll improve our process here at Elevate Church. Now, speaking of little kids, the next Sunday is going to be a special day because not only are we celebrating our Christmas service, not only are we having baptism, the kids will have their Christmas pajama day here at Elevate Kids. So next week when you register your little ones, make sure they come all decked out in their Christmas uh, pajamas. They're going to have an awesome time within Elevate Kids. Now, baptism next Sunday. If you have not taken the step to take your faith public and you would like to be baptized, time is running out. This is our last baptism of 2020 and what a year to be baptized right like it would be like you will never forget your baptism date for sure now i am going because god is good and, I, and god has grace upon us i'm going to have grace upon thee and i'm going to give you a little bit more time to register so if you want to register go to our we, our church website which you all should know by heart so uh, we're going to call out Adrian. Adrian, what? I'm just kidding. The, our church website is www.goelevatechurch.com. Top right-hand corner, you click those three little lines and click on sign up and then follow your way to baptism. I will personally send you an email and you and I will have a Zoom chat this week and you will be getting dunked next Sunday. Weather is going to be amazing. And finally, a cold front, the water will be chilly, but Jesus will be with you. All right, so make sure today is the last day to sign up. Now, with that being said, it is our sixth, day, uh, sixth year anniversary. We can't thank you guys enough for, for standing alongside and running alongside us in this journey. Uh, we're so extremely happy and, and we're blessed by you. So let's all stand to our feet. Let's wrap up this service, both here and online. And if you're watching us online, I, I have one last message for you. We want to see you back at church. We want you to register today at 5 p.m. And I want to see your face here at Elevate Church next Sunday. So on the count of three, we're going to clap and we're going to cheer you on so that you can register and we will save you a seat right there. On the count of three, one, two, three. Let's give it up for those online. We want to see you here next Sunday. So don't forget to register. Let's pray. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being the risen King. Thank you, Father, for the mercy and the grace that you have shown us. Thank you for the salvation that we find in only in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the people that you are going to put in our path this week where we can share and testify. And Lord, we may be the light and shine um, and point them in your direction. God, thank you for these last six years as Elevate Church. Thank you for all the miracles for the people's lives that have changed. Thank you, Father, for the projects that have happened. Thank you, Lord, for keeping our doors open. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to proclaim the gospel. Lord, we now pray as, as um, the project ends, our, our journey continues. Lord, thank you for what you've done these last 12 days of giving. Thank you for the sacrifices for the families. Lord, we've asked for your provision that you would protect us. Keep us healthy, Lord. And may we always um, uh, cry out your name, Father, and proclaim the name of Jesus everywhere we go. We love you, Father. We praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. This now concludes our online service. Everybody wave to our friends online. See you here next week, Sunday. Register today at 5 p.m.